If you have your Bibles, open, if you would, please, to Daniel, the book of Daniel, chapter number one. Our theme this year, help me here, is I believe God. Let's try that one more time. I believe God. We looked at, at uh, the situation with the Apostle Paul in a, in a storm. If you weren't here for those messages, I'd encourage you to look them up on YouTube and, and on Facebook Live and go back and listen to what Paul faced. He faced the storm of all storms, and yet he said, be of good cheer, sirs, for I believe God. No matter what storm you're facing in life, you can make the decision of faith to believe God. We're now going to come to the life and the story of Daniel. What a tremendous figure Daniel is in the Scripture. I grew up in church, and I grew up hearing stories about Daniel. Help me here. What is the most famous story of Daniel? Help me. Daniel and the lion's, lion's den. Man, what a great story to hear in Sunday school for the first time. Think back if you know that story to the first time you heard it in Sunday school. Most of you probably had a good teacher like I had who would act out a lot of the story. How many had a teacher like that? Oh, man, they're talking about Daniel getting lowered into, the, into this den of lions, this cave, and lions in there, and, and they're acting out these big old lions walking around the room, and, and God shut their mouths. God did that. Right. And boy, you heard about that power and the victory that God brought. We'll look at that story again. Sometimes the most familiar things are the things that can teach us some of the greatest truths. Because they're so familiar, if we're not careful, we kind of gloss over them in our mind. I come to this figure named Daniel in the Bible. What an amazing man that he became as he followed God. He didn't start out as an amazing man. He started out as a faithful young person. You know what that tells me? You can start out any place in life and you can follow God. You don't have to have the same background as someone else. We saw that with Abraham and Isaac. Abraham, the great patriarch, the great man who was given the promise of all of Israel. Abraham in the Bible did not start out in a Christian home, yet he chose to follow God. It doesn't matter what your background is. You can follow God. We'll look over the next few weeks at three different times that Daniel specifically chose to believe in God. I think it'll be a help and blessing to us. And if you would look in Daniel chapter 1, verse number 1, in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came in Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with part of the vessels of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar, to the house of his God. And he brought the vessels into the treasure house of his God." Lord, I thank you for this time this morning. Lord, I pray you'd guide us and help us. Lord, as we look at this, this account of Daniel, your servant, Lord, we're going to see the times that he trusted you. Lord, I pray that would challenge our hearts, that no matter what we face, no matter what obstacle that we think is in front of us, Lord, that we'd realize that you are greater, you are more worthy of our belief and faith than anything else. Lord, may we be challenged and strengthened this morning. In Jesus' name I ask, amen. I stopped after those first two verses because we're in a dire place in this part of Scripture. Jehoiakim was, was king in the land of, of, of Judah, a place that God had originally established for his chosen people. They were led first by a king named Saul, who was turned out not to be a faithful king, though he was God's chosen king. He ended up getting uh, replaced as king because of his lack of obedience to God. He decided that he, as a king, uh, didn't have to obey what God had said to do. Well, that's funny. I know some people who also think the same thing sometimes. Who say, I know what God says, but I'll still do it my way. God said to Saul, that's not okay. You just can't do it your way. I'm the creator of the universe. I'm the king of kings and lord of lords. You have to do it my way. He was replaced by a man that many of you will know as King David. Oh, David was a great king. He was called in Scripture a man after God's own heart. A man that God said that about him, not the people of Israel. God said that he's a man after my own heart. What a tremendous testimony for God to look down. And he knows us. He wasn't saying David was perfect. Don't, 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 don't mistake that. Sometimes we read about these Bible characters. We're like, man, I could, I could never be that. Yes, you can. With God's grace, you can. 
He wasn't saying that David was perfect, but he said, this man is a man and his heart is turned toward me. It's often used in Scripture throughout the kings. In fact, as you study the kings that follow David, you'll often see this pattern, that this king was a good king because he followed after the steps of his father, David. And it wasn't a literal father, it was a figurative. He was good years back, and they would follow what David did. Tremendous example. And then after David, there was Solomon. After Solomon, the kingdom was divided. Now we have two kingdoms. And it was at that point, and really a little bit before that, that the children of Israel, though they had seen and known of the power of God and seen him over and over, they began to reject God. They rejected him in quite physical ways. They would actually set up other idols and worshiped other idols. They would, at one point in Scripture, talks about how they would even offer their children as a sacrifice. You say, how does someone get to the point where you'd offer your own child? Because they consistently ignored God and turned their own way. Anytime that we ignore God, it'll take us places that we don't want to go. We don't get to choose the end point. We just get to choose whether to turn toward God or turn away from God. And God in his mercy would bring other countries, the Bible teaches us this, would bring other countries in. And they would besiege or they would set war to Judah and to Israel in order to get the, the children of Israel, all right, God's people, to turn back to him. God said, I'm going to bring some hardship, so you have to rely upon me again. And the scripture is filled with times that they did this, and God did amazing things. In fact, there was one time I read this last week, and I thought this was so cool. You've heard about these times when people challenge God. Have you heard about these times? There's a story that has circulated the internet. I don't believe it's true. About this professor. And the story goes that he's a professor that would stay in a room of 300 students. And every year in in this classroom, you've heard this story, he'd have a piece of chalk. And he said, I challenge the God of the universe if he's the real God when I drop this chalk to let it not break. And if anyone believes in him to stand, and, and the story goes that, that is on the internet that as he dropped it, it would every year shatter into a thousand pieces. All right, at that point, I know it's not true because chalk does not shatter into a thousand pieces when you drop it on the ground, all right, from waist height. But it's, it's a good story. And the story goes on to say that there was one time that a student stood, and the professor was so flabbergasted that he dropped it, it caught the cuff of his shirt, hit the hem of his pants, and fell to the ground, didn't break, and he walked out of the classroom. I don't believe that to be true. Could it be true? Yes or no? Sure it could be. But I was reading this past week about a time with Hezekiah. And a country came, and they said this to Hezekiah, who was a king of Israel, who was a godly man. They said to Hezekiah, they said, your God, that's Jehovah, the real God, will not stand up against us. He won't do anything. He said, they, they said, we've defeated the gods of this country and this country and this country, and your God is no match for our army. That's what he said. He said, we've defeated the the God of the cliffs and the valleys, the high places and the low places, and your God is nothing. Problem is, the real God heard him. Benedad heard him say that. That was a problem. And I, and I I knew that story. I'd read that before, but I'd never caught this before. The Bible says that God came to the prophet Isaiah, and he said to Isaiah, don't worry. I'm going to cause a rumor to come and this king is going to die. He's going to go back home and die. And sure enough, two verses later, there was a rumor that there was a battle at home. So the king, who was setting fire over here, said, uh-oh, ran home and died. Got killed at home. You say, well, what's that have to do with anything, Pastor Howell? Well, it struck me as something. That this guy had stood up and said, fine, if you're really God, prove it. And God did. Amen. But the king never knew it. He told Isaiah... And he said, Isaiah, this is what I'm going to do. No one's going to know that I'm involved in this except for you, but I'm involved in this. And I don't need to rain thunder and lightning. I can just have a rumor. That's all I need. It, it won't even be a rumor that's here. It'll be in another country. The rumor will be in another country. You won't, you won't, I don't have to drop hail on your head and strike you dead. I can have a whisper, and that'll defeat you. That's how powerful our God is. He can do all things according to the counts of his own will. So the children of Israel in this passage, the first two verses, Jehoiakim was the king. Nebuchadnezzar from Babylon came and they besieged, they, they, they set a campment around the city in order to take over the city because the, the land had refused to serve God. And they were so hardened in their hearts to God. They didn't turn toward God, they just tried to placate the king, Nebuchadnezzar. 
If you count verse number 2, the Bible says that he took the vessels from the house of the Lord and took them back to the house of his God. When I was studying for this passage, it struck me the things that were used in sacrifice to our God were used in pagan sacrifice. But the things that were, that were sacred and holy, things that would have no place in that, were used in some terrible religious endeavors. I began to think, what if someone came? Now, this is not the temple. This church is just a building. All right, the church is the body of, of people, not this building. But, but what if someone said, look at that pulpit. We're going to take it, and we're going to put it up in the church of Satan. Real churches. Would you be okay with that? Oh, you better believe I wouldn't be. Oh, you better believe I wouldn't be. Or they said, wow, you know, we can use these chairs. We'll take them to a, to a filthy establishment. It'll be great. And even though these chairs are just part of church, we would not be okay with that. And I look in this passage and I see some of the, what happened and some of the, the problems that came because these people who should have turned toward God didn't turn toward God. And it was a lot of people, a whole nation. You see, in the midst of this kind of setting for Daniel, he comes from a background that is very, very tough. And you may be able to identify with that. You may come from a situation that's tough. You may be surrounded by people that don't believe in God, that don't trust in God, that have no context, that have no respect for God or the things of God. And Daniel, in the background of this story, he comes from a land that has not been strong for the Lord. That's why they're getting, they're getting taken captive, because they've not worshipped God. You see, if we're not careful, we will think that David came from just a great situation. But David came... From a tough spot. He's about to get tested in a real way. Not in a first world coffee spilling way, but in a real way. A real way. What happens when you get tested? In a real way. What, ha what happens when you get tested just in a little way when the guy in front of you is going too slow? Listen, there's some Christians who are no longer Christian when the guy goes too slow. Is that all it takes? Is that all it takes? If that's what all it takes, I will tell you, listen, your faith is not strong. That's not a real test. That's just life. Slow drivers are life, right? Not a good life, but it's life. What happens when the person in front of you at Walmart can't figure out how to use a self-checkout machine? That's a first world problem right there. Before it was, they couldn't remember to pull up their money after they, after they got all their things scanned. I don't know how many times, countless times, they go to, you're like, did you not know you had to pay for groceries? How do you react in those? That's not a real test. So Daniel's about to be tested for real, a real test. Some of us would be ashamed if those stories of us were put in Scripture about the little things we face. What do you say when you're put on the spot? What do you say when people ask you the tough questions? Daniel's going to be asked these tough questions. When your coworkers ask you, do you really believe that a loving God will send people to hell? What, what do you say when you're tested? I want to notice a few things this morning from the, the account of Daniel. And notice, first of all, that they came to a different residence. They came to a different residence, and the Bible says that, that uh, in verse number 3, the king spake unto Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel and of the king's seed and of the princes. They besieged the land, they took the vessels, and now the king says, I want some of the good young men. I want some of the men from this country to come back to my country, different residents, and, and I'm looking for a certain specimen, a certain type of men. And the verses tell us, verse 4, and uh, verse 4 tells us what they are. Children in whom was no blemish. No blemish. They looked on the outside absolutely perfect. They were well put together. They were beautiful children. Some would say they were 8. Some would say they're 10 and 12 or 15. But, but some were there. They were not infants and they, they were not adults yet. And so probably 12 to 15, somewhere in there is where, they, is where they most likely sat. They were blemished, but well-favored and already skillful in all wisdom. 
they're, they're skillful in all wisdom, the Bible teaches us, that already at a young age, they were smart. These children were intelligent. They were doing things that, that other children could not do and, and cunning in knowledge. Cunning. Remember years ago, there was that show on TV, Are You Smarter Than, uh, was it fifth grader, fourth grader, was it? Fifth grader, smarter than a fifth grader. Have you ever watched that show, and don't admit this, were you ever stumped by the question the fifth graders got right? Now, don't admit that. Are you smarter than a fifth grader? These young men were smart. They were intelligent. They were skillful. They were cunning in knowledge and understanding science and had such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace. They were well-mannered young men. The ability to stand in the king's palace, they weren't just uncouth young men and, and rough around the edges. They weren't just running around everywhere. They were, they were established. They carried themselves well. They were intelligent. They were skillful. They were cunning. and They knew science and wisdom and knowledge and, and could carry themselves well. And they were still called in the Bible children. These were no ordinary children, were they? They, they were special. They would have been special in Israel. And now they're taken from their homes taken from their families, taken from their place of comfort for the purpose and whom they might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. You see, they were removed from their land, different residents. Daniel would have lived around 605 B.C. until about 530 B.C. He had the ability to stand in the king's palace. He was cunning in knowledge. We will see that throughout the, 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 the book of Daniel. You'll see the ability of Daniel and the knowledge of Daniel because, because Daniel was given a specific set of talents and abilities that would enable him to serve God to the fullest. You see, it was no accident that these young men, it was no accident that Daniel was talented and smart and intelligent and good-looking. It was a gift from God for his service. See, Daniel would go on, we'll go, we'll go on to the book of Daniel to do great things for God, including hearing about prophecy of things to come. And we're often gifted, we're gifted with a set of talents and abilities that will enable us to serve God to the, to the fullest. He was prepared for God's calling and prepared for God's mission. He just didn't realize what it was. He was at the king's palace, most likely maybe a prince or maybe just a goodly child. He thought... He was going this way, but God had a different plan for him. God had a different direction for him. God had a different residence for him. How do you react when your circumstances change? We don't like change. If I looked at your carpet in your house, I may know that you don't like change. It's the same carpet I've had for 45 years past. It's good enough for my grandparents. It's good enough for me. We don't like naturally like change too much. How do you react when God changes the equation? Are you okay with it? Are you, or are you tempted to argue and fight and say, God, you can't do that. This is where I'm supposed to be. Or God says, no, I have another plan for you, a better plan. I read this humorous story. There was a young man. He was watching a pastor build a trellis in his backyard. As the pastor worked, he, he talked to the young man, he said hello to him and said, hey, are you watching me so you can learn how to build things? To which the boy replied, no, I just want to see how a preacher reacts when he hits his thumb with a hammer. <laughs> how do you react when your thumb gets hit with a hammer? You, you, you may have your own set of plans and your own direction, your own ideas and goals, but God says, no, Daniel, I'm going to take you over here. All right, I've got something else for you. I've got another plan for you. I've prepared you for this plan. i put you in the perfect spot for this plan. I've enabled you to do this plan. So just believe me. See, this is just the background before Daniel makes any decision. Daniel, right here, could have reacted like many people that we know and could have become bitter at God. Said, God, that's not fair. Why did I have to leave my home? Why did I have to leave my comfort level? God, why did you take me? All right? Why, why, why? Rather than just believe God. Too often we're tempted to say, why, why, why? Not just, God, I believe you. Not only did they change 
their residence, they gave them different rations. Verse number five. This rations, this food, was really the catalyst for Daniel's strong stand. He stood on food. What a good young man. We can identify with that. The Bible says that the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat. See, in Bible times, in ancient times, meat and food was a sign of wealth. And really, the, the fatter that you were, the larger that you were, the more healthy and wealthier that you were, you had a sign of dignity if you were very large. Now, we'll see that. Let me fast forward to the end. When they looked more full and, 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 their che- and they were bigger, all right, that was because that was the point, to make them bigger. They didn't want them to look like, like, like starved refugees. All right, you're the king. You're in the king's palace, so you are well taken care of. If we follow that in America, in America we're very healthy and we're very wealthy. And there was a different set of rations. So we're going to change, we're going to change your food for three years. Tell you what, there's times we change food in life. It's not always a good thing. A few years back, I had the privilege to go to Cambodia, see Brother Rupal. I'm this type of guy, I'll eat whatever, whenever. I'll try it. You say, Pastor how did you get sick in Cambodia? I did. I did. It wasn't the Rupal's fault, though. We were at a, we were at a children's place, uh, doing a children's, uh, um, uh, like a backyard club. And there was a man outside selling fresh coconuts. And it was hot. I went there in January as well, like I went to Ghana. And it was hot, 100 plus degrees out there. You know, Brother Rupal, it was, Michigan was negative three, and, and uh, Cambodia was 103, it seemed like. So I bought three coconuts, one for Brother Rodney Rupal, one for Blake Rupal, one for myself. That was Saturday. Sunday was not a good day for J.D. Howell. I woke up and I was sick. I was sick like you would imagine if you have food poisoning in another country. I barely got out of bed, but I preached that morning. And I, I preached and then went back to bed. I had to go preach that night, and Brother Rubel's interpreting for me that night. I'm preaching in a different church about a half hour across town. My wife said this. She thought I was going to pass out when I was preaching. She said, you looked white. I had to grip the pulpit. But I preached for the church, and I preached. You know, I don't know what I said that night. <laughs> Probably a lot of heresy. Who knows what I said? I get done preaching. I'm not feeling real good at all. I didn't feel good all day. All right. And, uh, on the way back home, a young man's driving us. There's probably three or four ladies in the back seat, and I'm in the front seat. We're going over this bridge. I said, I'm going to throw up. They all start laughing. They're all laughing. My wife says, I think he's serious. You better pull over. He almost made it over. He almost, he almost did. Change your rations sometimes. Things don't work out that well. Now, in Ghana, that was great. I ate everything that in Ghana, and it was tremendous food. Right, brother? It was great food over there in Ghana. Didn't get sick at all. Can you imagine Daniel going to a new country or the brand new diet? But the point of this, this account was not that the diet was going to make him sick. Daniel did not say, oh, I shouldn't do this because I don't want my stomach. I have a tender stomach. I have a, I have a, I have a weak system. That wasn't the point. No, that wasn't the point. You see, they came to a different residence and did to different rations, and these, this food, this food did not line up with what Daniel was raised to believe as a child of God. Not only was there different rations, different names, or different rations, there was different names. And lastly, I want you to see their different names in verses 6 and 7. Now among these were the children of Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Their names, Daniel, God is my judge. Hananiah, God is gracious. Mishael, who is like God. And Azariah, God helps. Not only did they want to remove their identity, they said, you're going to come in a different place. You're going to come to a different location, a different house with different food. Now we're going to remove what you're even called. And Daniel, who was called God is my judge, was named Belshazzar, or Bel, that was a God, protect the king. Hananiah, who was called Hananiah, God is gracious, was changed to Shadrach, speaking of the god Marduk or Aku. Mishael, whose name means who is like our God, was changed to Meshach, which is an ancient name for Venus. And Azariah, which means God helps, was changed to Abednego, the servant of Nebo. But the Babylonians made a mistake. I want you to catch this morning. 
The Babylonians mistakenly believed that by changing these young men's names and changing their house and changing their diet, they would change what was in their heart. But they were wrong. They thought if we change their outward religion, it'll change what's in here. See, true religion does not flow from without. It flows from within. And, and it did, it, it did, their name, it didn't matter. This is what mattered. You see, even in 2020, sometimes we think, well, I can be spiritual from without. I go to church, pastor. Well, la-di-da. Really? Going to church does not make you a Christian. Well, pastor, I got baptized. Getting baptized does not make you a Christian. It's not from without. It's from within. And the Babylonians made the mistake. Listen, we'll call you Belshazzar. You're now going to serve Bel, our god Bel. And Daniel said, you can change my name, but you can't change my God. What's inside always comes out. They didn't just have a religion. They had a relationship. There was a young Jewish boy who grew up in Germany many years ago. The lad had a profound sense of admiration for his father, who saw to it that life of the family revolved around the religious Jewish practices of their faith. The count goes, a father led them to the synagogue faithfully. In his teen years, however, the boy's family was forced to move into another town in Germany. But this town had no synagogue only a Lutheran church. The life of this particular town and community revolved around the Lutheran church. All of the best people of this town went to the Lutheran church. Unfortunately, suddenly the father announced to the family that they're going to abandon their Jewish traditions and join the Lutheran church. When the stunned family asked why, the father explained that it would be good for business. The youngster was bewildered and confused. His deep disappointment soon gave way to anger, and a bitterness plagued him throughout his life. You see, when religion is just from the outside, it's just from external sources, it doesn't flow from within, we'll be quick to change for business, but all it is is hypocrisy. I'll just become what's around me. I'll just change what's around me. It'll benefit me. Later, this young man left Germany, went to England to study. Each day found him at the British Museum, formulating his ideas and composing a book. In the book, he introduced a whole new worldview and conceived a movement that was designed to change the world. He committed people who followed him to life without God. His name? Karl Marx. Karl Marx, the father and leader of the communist movement. You see, our religion is not an external thing. It's internal. For Daniel and for Hananiah and Azariah and Mishael, it was internal. And this morning, I want to challenge us, if we're going to believe God, it can't come from the outside, it must come from the inside. Maybe you're here today, you've never trusted Christ as your Savior. And you come to church, I'm glad you do. You ought to. But come with the church. Will no more make you a Christian than sitting in a refrigerator will make you a cucumber. Coming to church is good, but trusting Christ is the way to heaven. You see, it's from the inside. You may be here saved today, going through a trial, and say, but, but Lord, I'm, I'm doing these things. It's not from the outside. It must come from the inside. You can change my name. You can change my home. But you can't change my God. Lord, I thank you for your word this morning. Thank you for what we can learn from Daniel and his three friends. And Lord, I pray you'd help us to be honest. There may be someone here today who's been going or, or through a hardship or hard trial, Lord. They're tempted to step aside from you. Lord, I pray that their faith and resolve in you would be strengthened today. They would make the choice to believe you. Lord, there may be someone here today who's never trusted you as your Savior, who maybe has come to church, maybe even been baptized, but never trusted you as their, as their Savior. Lord, I pray that this morning you would touch their heart. 
they would realize that we don't go to heaven because of what's outside, but what's inside. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, I wonder who would say, Pastor, would you pray for me this morning? As you spoke, God spoke to me, and there's something that I, a decision that I need to make. Maybe you need to, to turn back toward God. Maybe you need to trust God. Maybe there's a hardship in your life. But you said, Pastor, would you pray for me when you pray this morning? I'm going through something, and God touched my heart. Amen. Amen. Just lift your hand up, slip back down. I'll see it. Amen. 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 Hands all over. Amen. I see that. God bless you. Amen. I wonder if there's someone here this morning who, as I was preaching, you know in your heart that you've never trusted Christ as your Savior. You've never believed on Jesus, and, and you've maybe tried to have religion from the outside. I'd love to pray for you when I pray for the others. You say, Pastor, would you, would you pray for me? I don't know that I have a, a relationship with Jesus Christ. I've never trusted Him as my Savior. Would you pray for me this morning when you pray for the others? Would, would you slip your hand up, slip it back down? I'll no, bring no more attention to you than I did anyone else. I'd love to pray for you today. Say this to me, Pastor. I've never trusted Christ. And would you pray for me, though? I, I want to have a real relationship with Him. I don't want just an external religion. Can I pray for you this morning? You say, just slip your hand up, slip back down. We'll see it. Say, that's me this morning. Slip it up and slip it down. Lord, you've seen these hands. You know the hearts. Lord, help us to take the decision to you in faith. Lord, bless this invitation in Jesus' name. Amen.